Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Uh, it's a big day this morning. We're in Exodus 19 and 20. So we are going to get to see the Father, the Most High, show up and show up in a big way. Exodus 19 sets this up and Exodus 20 delivers. There's a lot here. And I pray that I'm up to the task of uh, reading this word with you all this morning. So, come in as the worship band brings it down. Just a little bit. Light, light, simmer down, light, nice. A little tap, tap. Let's count quarters on the ride. Gentle bass. Just the gentle bass. And with the up here worship band bass player, you know, doing some of this, gentle bass, little acoustic guitar, nice, maybe some humming, let's get some humming, coffee's in the back, next to the donuts, they were not fried in, in lard, um, find your seats, pull out your Bibles, we are in uh, Exodus 19, which is Shamot, Shamona. 19. Um, <clears throat> I get this question every single video in the comments. This is the scriptures from the Institute for Scriptural Research. You see that? You can just Google the scriptures. This is about 22, 24 ish dollars paperback, 35 ish hardback. I have explained a hundred thousand times why it is that I use this book. Um, but I guess one more for posterity. A. Preserves the name of the deity. Yahuwah or Yahweh and Yehoshua or Yeshua for the Lord God and Jesus which are um different conversations for another time, but preserves the name of the deity. Um, it is a direct literal translation from the Hebrew to the English. It's not a translation that's been stepped on dozens of times by the Big C Church for an agenda. And <clears throat> my favorite is that in the New Testament, when somebody, but especially including the Messiah, preaches or speaks the Old Testament, it's in bold with the reference to the chapter and verse. Um, that's really powerful because, again, it proves that the only thing separating the Old Testament and the New Testament is one thin blank page. That this is a whole Bible. That it's not the Old Testament for the Jews and the New Testament for the Christians. That it all works together. That's why I use this translation, the scriptures, from the Institute for Scriptural Research, the ISR. You can Google it and you can find it. Um, so... Every week I get that question, and I guess... <laughs> yeah, there's the answer. So, Exodus 19. <clears throat> Alright, worship band, take it down. Thank you guys, you've done great this morning. You did a really, that was a really good rendition of how great their art. Uh, that's really good, uh, I loved that. Especially the way you build it. That was great. And then it starts with this. Ba, 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 ba. Right. Then sings my soul, my savior God to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art. So. Anyway, you're dismissed, worship band. Great job. We'll see you at the end. Um, so, let's turn in our Bibles, the scriptures, to Exodus 19. Shamot 19. In the third new moon, after the children of Israel had come out of the land of Mitzrayim, on this day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. So when? On the third new moon, after they'd left Egypt. So, a couple, three months, okay? Because who knows when the last new moon was. Well, actually it tells us prior, but about three months. After, <clears throat> they came to the wilderness of Sinai. For they set out from Rephidim, and they had come to the wilderness of Sinai, and they camped there in the wilderness. Where? The wilderness of Sinai. 
right? Usually when you see something repeated twice, sometimes even three times in this word, it's important. So it's, it's a foot stomp. If it says it twice, it's like, listen up, boy, I told you twice. Where? In the wilderness of Sinai. So, <clears throat> and they camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountains. Israel meaning the nation of Israel. Okay. The children of Jacob, right? His heirs. And Moshe, Moses, went up to Elohim. And Yahweh called to him from the mountain, saying, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, Jacob, and declare to the children of Israel. You have seen, this is quote, this is Yahweh talking, you have seen what I did to the Mitzrites, to the Egyptians. You know what I am capable of, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. You know what I'm capable of and what I brought you out of. And now... If, this is important, and now if, this is Yahweh speaking, the creator of the universe speaking to Moshe, and he told Moshe, write this down in perpetuity for my people, which is why we have this. So he's speaking to us. And now, if you diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, then you shall be then, if then, then you shall be my treasured possession above all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a reign of priests and a set-apart nation, a holy nation, a sanctified nation. <clears throat> Let's read that again. 19.5 And now, if, if implies action, if implies you have a choice. And now, if you diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all peoples, for the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a reign of priests and a set-apart nation. Those are the words which you are to speak to the children of Israel. We are they. They are us. We are the children of Israel. This is something we've talked about myriad times here, but we have, by the hand of the Father, literal thousands of new people coming on board each week. And um, so we'll clarify. <clears throat> we are Israel, even if we are Gentiles and we're grafted in. Anybody who knows anything about agriculture knows that you have to, gra you have to graft in the branch to the root stock. The branch cannot survive without the root stock. That's why the, this series is called No Roots, No Fruit. You don't get any fruit on the branch without being attached to the roots. <clears throat> and so salvation is independent of and only by the atoning sacrifice of Yeshua. That's salvation. That's your eternal soul. Blessings here. It says right here, if you diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a reign of priests and a set-apart nation. We're not talking about eternal salvation here. We're talking about blessings. Guard my covenant and you'll be my treasured possession. And Moshe came and called for the elders of the people and set before them all these words which Yahweh commanded to him. He said, look, this is what the Father told me. He called the elders, okay? Came and called for the elders of the people and set before them all these words which Yahweh had commanded him. He said, listen, here's the deal, okay? This is what's up. So he's offering the word of the Father to them, okay? And all the people answered together and said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we shall do. So they agreed to this covenant. It says right here, If you obey my voice, diligently obey my voice, and guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all peoples. 
Moshe brings that to the elders. The elders clearly brought this to the people because it says in 8, 19, 8, and all the people answered together and said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we shall do. So they have agreed to this covenant that if then, if you do this, then you will be blessed. <coughs> So Moshe brought back the words of the people to Yahweh. Moshe, Moses, is serving as the, uh, the go-between here, okay? In between the father and the father's people. So the father talks to Moshe. Moshe talks to the people. The people talk to Moshe. Moshe talks to the father, okay? Kind of a, an old world game of telephone going on here. And Yahweh said to Moshe, see, okay, good, you agreed? Okay, if then, good. The date is on. We set the date. We're good. We're good to move forward. Okay. And Yahweh said to Moshe, see, I am coming to you in a thick cloud so that the people hear when I speak to you and believe you forever. Now I'm going to show up. You've entered into an agreement with me. We have a covenant I've offered and you've accepted. Now I'm going to show up. Boy, there's a parallel there for us. The father extends his hand and says, If you diligently obey my voice and guard my covenant, then you'll be my treasured people. And we accept and say, Yes, father, we accept. And then he says, I'm going to show up. I'm coming. This is archetypical. Okay, this book, uh, and we can, regardless of where you, you land on the historicity of this book as to whether or not these things actually happened or if they're just fables or fairy tales or nice stories to teach us about humanity. There's got to be a hundred different levels this book can be read on. So we'll just go here with this one. Regardless of where you land on that, there's a very strong lesson right there. The Father extends to us the offer for us to be his chosen people by guarding his commands and diligently heeding his voice. And if we accept that offer, then he shows up. See, I am coming to you, says Yahweh. How many times have we cried out, Father, I need you. Come to me, I need you. He says, if you diligently keep my commands diligently obey my voice and guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all peoples. And I will show up for you. I don't think that it would be good stewardship for me to move beyond that without making that point. So nine, Yahweh says to Moshe, see I am coming to you in the thick cloud so that the people hear when I speak to you and believe you forever more testimony. I'm coming. You'll see me. They'll believe you, Moshe. <clears throat> Remember, these are the same people who were grumbling just a chapter ago about you brought us out here in the wilderness to die. Why don't we just stay in Mitzrayim? And so the father's like, look, I'm coming. They will see and believe. Shock and awe, baby. Shock and awe. There will be no doubt, which we've talked about before. This New Testament ideology of I can't wait for the coming of the Lord, the glory of the Lord to be upon me. Man, when the glory of the Lord shows up, it's, it's good, but boy, is it dangerous if you're on the wrong side of the equation in the eyes of the Most High. So, and Moshe reported the words of the people to Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Moshe, go tomorrow and set apart today and tomorrow and set them apart today and tomorrow. Go to the people and set them apart today and tomorrow, and they shall wash their garments and shall be prepared by the third day. We're establishing timeline. Today, tomorrow, the third day, okay? Set yourself apart, sanctify yourself. Literally, holy, holy, holify yourself, okay? Holy means sanctified, sanctified literally means set apart, to be set apart from, okay? Set yourself apart today and tomorrow, and they shall wash their garments, and they shall be prepared by the third day. For on the third day, Yahweh shall come down upon Mount Sinai before the eyes of all the people. Here's when I'll be here. Timeline, okay? 
and you shall make a border for the people all around Mount Sinai, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch the border of it. <clears throat> Whoever touches the mountain shall certainly be put to death. Not a hand is to touch it, but he shall certainly be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, he shall not live. Okay, so we're establishing a border around the mountain. The glory of the Lord appears. Do not go up to it. Do not touch it. Do not go over this line. This is the demarcation. Things will not go well for you. Surely you will not live. Okay. The glory of the Lord. I can't wait for the glory of the Lord. Have you read this Bible? Are you aware of what happens when the Father shows up? Even in all his glory. The Father tells us in Genesis, No man can look upon my face and live. Yet we have this New Testament idea of, I can't wait to see him face to face. You know, we can get into the metaphysical of that. Maybe, you know, you die to your physical self and you're reborn a spiritual human being. You know, your spirit, your soul is revived by looking upon the face of the Father. Yeah, and we can have all kinds of spiritual conjecture on that. That's great. Uh, and truthfully, with a glass of whiskey and a fire, that'd be a great conversation to have. But the word says, no man can look upon my face and live. So, at what level do we read that on? I'm going to go with literal. Literal. So, somebody, by the way, is shooting a suppressed rifle across the way. Sounds like an AR-15. So, about 60% crack and 40% pop. And it's too repetitive or too uh, staccato and close together to be... It's not a bolt gun. It's... So, they're not training either because it's too sporadic for that. I think they're shooting hogs or coyotes. A lot of coyotes last night. A lot. To where at 1 o'clock in the morning I was seriously thinking about getting out of bed, grabbing a rifle just for fun to go shoot coyotes. <clears throat> anyway, neither here nor there. Um, so, don't go across this line, okay? When the yobel sounds long... The shofar, Yobel being a ram's horn, which you would make a trumpet or a shofar out of. When the ram's horn sounds long, let them come near the mountain. So we'll give a blast when it's safe. We will sound the trumpet. Boo! That's what a trumpet sounds like, by the way, when it's safe. Uh, and Moshe came down from the mountain to the people and set the people apart, and they washed their garments, and he said to the people, Be prepared. And by the third day, be prepared by the third day. Do not come near a wife. Don't go getting busy with it, okay? We need to... Yeah, okay. And it came to be on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the voice of a shofar of a trumpet was very strong and all the people who were in the camp trembled. Here comes the glory of the Lord, the Father, Yahweh. El Shaddai, Adonai, the great I am, is showing up in person. Here we are. Now remember, he led these people out of bondage by a column of smoke and a column of fire. I don't know how you could doubt the existence of him, capital H, him, after that. Yet here he comes again. And he's coming proud and loud, man. Undeniable, he is showing up. <clears throat> and all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet with Elohim, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was in smoke, all of it, because Yahweh des descended upon it in fire. And its smoke went up like the smoke of a furnace, and all the mountain trembled exceedingly. And when a voice of the shofar sounded long and became very strong, Moshe spoke, and Elohim answered him by voice. And Elohim answered him by voice. They can hear <clears throat> his word. Now, there are a lot of people, or at least there are certain camps of opinion and conjecture, that um, this is all due to um, 
plate tectonics and volcanic activity? Maybe so. Maybe so. If it is, I have no issue believing that the Father is capable of using those things for his purposes. Um, there's uh, the Exodus Decoded documentary talks quite a bit about volcanic activity and plate tectonics causing the split of the Red Sea and the uh, ten plagues that hit Egypt. It's an interesting um, thesis. Maybe. Maybe. Do I think that the Father can't use that? Of course he can use that. He's the most high. He does what he wants to do, right? And the rest of us just kind of sit back in awe. So, maybe. Now, remember, this is only 90 days after that, give or take. So it's entirely possible that we're still dealing with plate tectonics. If that's the case. And if it's not, and it doesn't at all cheapen the Father doing what the Father does. I think it's the opposite of that. I think it, I think the observed wonders of science inform how the Father does what he does. The fact that mathematically speaking with our human minds, we still can't put him in a box. We still can't figure him out. That physics go, oh, we got it figured out. Oh, we got to do it. Ah, ah. No, we don't have it figured. Okay, well, if we do this, and then, okay, well, that doesn't work with this. And onward we march with our numbers and with our slide rules and with our binoculars and our microscopes trying to figure him out. And I don't think there's anything wrong with the fact that we can't. I don't want to worship something or someone that I can quantify and put in a box because that means that I'm more powerful than he is. And that is clearly not the case. He is far more powerful, infinitely more powerful than I will ever be. And all the power that I do have comes from him, by him. I'm just a steward of it. So I think it's okay that science may have a, an explanation for this. But I think for me, all it does is inform the mechanisms that the Most High may have used to accomplish his will. It does not explain it away at all. I think, if anything, it makes it that much more interesting for me. <clears throat> and Elohim answered him by voice. And Yahweh came down from Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain, and Yahweh called Moshe to the top of the mountain, and Moshe went up. Face to face. Well, they're visiting anyway. I don't know about the face to face part. It does not say that here. And Yahweh said to Moshe, Go down and warn the people, lest they break through and fall, break through unto Yahweh to see, and many of them fall. Do not come near, is what he's saying. Go warn the people, do not come near. And let the priests who come near Yahweh set themselves apart too, yes, lest Yahweh break out against them. And Moshe said to Yahweh, the people are not able to come up on Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, Make a border around the mountain and set it apart. We did what you told us to do. Good. And Yahweh said to him, Come, go down and then come up, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to Yahweh, lest he break out against them. And Moshe went down to the people and spoke to them. That's the end of 19. The Father offers this covenant, this contract, this agreement to Moshe. If you diligently heed my voice and guard my covenant, you'll be my set apart people and I will show up for you. And Moshe brings it to the people and they say, yeah, we're in. And Moshe brings that back to the Father, and he says, cool, I'm coming. Here's what you need to do in the meanwhile to get ready for me coming. And they do that. And then Yahweh, the creator of the universe, Hashem, El Shaddai, Adonai, the Most High, the Great I Am, the one that there are no words for, shows up. And now, he's ready to have a conversation with Moshe for us for all people. That's Exodus 19.
let's hop into 20. <clears throat> Perhaps some of the most famous and yet twisted and misunderstood words in these scriptures that we have. The Ten Commandments. <clears throat> and Elohim and Elohim spoke all these words, saying, I am Yahweh, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of slavery. I'm reminding you who I am and what I have done for you. You have no other mighty ones against my face. There is no God but God. It is Yahweh and Yahweh alone. You have no other mighty ones against my face. Remember what I've done for you. And remember that he took them out of a polytheistic society of sun worship, the god Ra and Osiris and all these other, the, you know, the gods of the Nile. And when Pharaoh said, throw all the Hebrew male firstborn children, or all the Hebrew children, male children into the river, there's a strong teaching that that was a sacrifice to the river gods, the water gods of the Nile. Plus the practicality of these Hebrews are too strong. I don't want them around anymore. The sun is over there. Can we do it? How's that? Okay, we'll go over here now. <clears throat> He's reminding them what he has done for them, what he has done for us. You have no gods but me. Now, many a sermon has been preached of what false idols, what false gods have we made out of today's society. You need to dig deep inside yourself and answer that question for yourself. Is, is it fear? Is it pride? Is it lust? Is it money? Greed? Sloth? Avarice? Hate? Pride? The first four words in this book. What are they? Anybody? In the beginning, in the beginning, Elohim. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, Yahweh. In the beginning, Him. You have no gods but God. You do not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of that which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth below or is which in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am a jealous God, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers on the, gen on the children uh, to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. But, showing loving commitment to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. Even Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Do what I tell you to do. You do not bow down to them, for I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am a jealous God, visiting the crookedness of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving commitment to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. That's pretty straightforward. Now we have this concept of the... Sins of the Father do not pass on to the Son. Do not hate El Shaddai. Do not hate Yahweh. Do not hate Him. Generational cursing is a real thing. And you can bring it upon yourself and your children for generations to come by hating the Father and not guarding His commands. You do not bring the name of Yahweh, your Elohim, to naught, for Yahweh does not leave one unpunished who brings his name to naught. Do not speak something to him and then do nothing with it. 
Do not utter his name for no good reason. <clears throat> 28. Remember the Sabbath day. Remember the Sabbath day to set it apart. Remember the Sabbath day. Sunday is the day of sun worship, S U N worship, that was adopted by the early church, during which time we also get Helio Christos, the personification of Messiah as the sun god. You will note many pictures from the time, paintings from the time show him with sun radiating out of his chest and with a halo of sun around his head. They made him the sun god. He was not. He was the son of God. The Sabbath has been counted uninterrupted. The Omer has been counted uninterrupted for 4,000 plus years. It's on what the world calls Saturday. This is the only command here where it says, remember. Remember the Sabbath and set it apart to the Father. Six days you labor and shall do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahweh your Elohim. You do not do any work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor the stranger who is within your gates. So it's not just for me, it's for you if you're visiting me too. Nor the stranger who is within your gates. There is one law for the children of Israel and the stranger within their gates. Now what is work? There's a lot of teaching on this. I'll tell you briefly. I'm going to run through this real quick because I get this question a lot. How do we keep Sabbath? This number one, we read this book. We are intentional about our time that we spend with the Father in his word, in praise of him and praying to him. <clears throat> we spend time together as a family. We often fellowship. We have brethren that are close and we have brethren that are not close, but we go see them if we can, when we can. We are very intentional again with our time that we are being mindful of the Most High. We don't do work. What does that mean? Well, we don't transact any business. We don't handle any money. We don't make anybody work for us. By that, we don't go out to eat. Um, I don't do things that make me go, ugh. <sighs> so if you're a diesel mechanic with a gardening hobby, you shouldn't be working on trucks, but you might could work in your garden until it makes you go, ugh. If you're a gardener with a diesel mechanic hobby, you can't go work in the garden. That's your job. But you might go turn wrenches until such a time as it's making you go, ugh. But the idea is to be mindful of the Father and to set it apart to him. You are to rest. Yeshua taught that Sabbath was made for man. Man was not made for Sabbath. You are to rest. Six days you shall labor. So the implication here also is not just that you rest on the Sabbath, but also you better get your bad word off the couch six days a week. You know, we had a comment last week. Somebody said, hey man, love the message. Don't appreciate the language. I get that. I'm not for everybody, and everybody's not for me. That's cool. Uh, if you think me saying hell is bad, you don't know who I am. And that is a testimony to the Most High, because I can swear the paint off a barn at 300 meters without trying. So I do my best to police my language, but I'm not for everybody, and everybody's not for me. <clears throat> we don't work. On Shabbat we don't do things that make us go ugh on Shabbat we rest and the other six days of the week we work we get after it so it is a it is a both it's not an if or it's an end both you work six days per week and you don't work on Shabbat you rest on Shabbat and you are mindful of the Father and you worship him and you read his word and you praise him and you give thanks for salvation through Yeshua and for the blessings in your life and you fellowship with people and you love on people and you love on your family 
and you're at peace. You be at peace on Shabbat. It's sanctified. It's set apart. It's sanctified. It's holy. It's a holy day. You are to conduct yourself as if you are holy, you are sanctified, you are set apart, and you are tr to treat the day as if. This is the day that an honored guest comes to your house, that the Father is indwelt in your dwelling today. He is here visiting with you, and you invite him in, and you are to behave as such. Hopefully every day, but at the very least on Shabbat, and you are to be restful. Okay. <coughs> For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested in the seventh day. Therefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart. <coughs> Respect your father and your mother, so that your days are prolonged upon the soil which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you. Respect your father and your mother, so that your days are prolonged upon the soil which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you. That's pretty straightforward. Yet how many times did we transgress that one? I can tell you right now, I can be much better at that. Not that I'm disrespectful toward them, but I don't make enough time for them. Fact, hard truth. And it will be one of these things, one of these days where they will not be around to make time for. So I ought to be better at that now while I can be. 13 you do not murder this is this right here is a sermon and i'm looking at every one of you who's ever worn the uniform worn the badge been in harm's way this does not say you do not kill ecclesiastes tells us that there is a time for everything a time to gather stones and a time to cast them away stones are ammunition yeshua says if you do not have a sword sell your cloak and buy one and this is a sword in today's modern vernacular, okay? So, it's not do not kill, it's do not murder. And there are many instances of killing that are justified and justifiable. Self-defense is what I'm talking about here. I'm not saying you go out and kill people because the Father told you to. That's not what I'm saying at all, and that's not what this word says. But if you're on a mission, if you're protecting your friends and family, your homeland, your loved ones, if somebody is trying to kill you and you kill them back quicker, faster, better, harder, stronger, you're good. Murder occurs here first, and then here. Murder is a crime of the heart. So there is redemption through Yeshua, and through his atoning sacrifice. And a lot of servicemen and servicewomen come to me with this and they say, man, I've done some really messed up stuff in my life. How could the Father ever love me? I've killed people, T. Uh-huh. I've sinned. Maybe you have. Let's talk about it. Did you murder anybody? No, never. You're good doesn't mean you don't have that blood guilt doesn't mean you don't feel that that doesn't mean that you don't have a hurt locker crammed full of stuff that needs to be addressed but in that regard you're good Yahweh is a warrior Yahweh is his name it tells us Exodus 15 3 Yahweh is a warrior Yahweh is his name the father understands battle and he understands killing and he knows the difference between killing and murder 14. You do not commit adultery. It's pretty straightforward. You do not commit adultery. Um, Yeshua goes on with this to say that if you even look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery against her. That is something that we all need to be mindful of especially in this era today of women wearing clothing that 20 years ago wouldn't have even been considered underwear. 
the Zitziot from Numbers 15, which we will get to, the Rebellion of Korah, the instruction there is to wear these and to have them as a reminder to do not the harlotry of your own eyes. That's powerful. The harlotry of your own eyes. Yeah. I'll tell you point blank, when there's women walking around, you'd see every curve of their body because of the clothes that they're wearing. I have to do one of these. I have to do one of these. And if I look at that thing, I've got to repent over that. That's not mine. That's not for me. And I think women, that's something that we really need, all of us really need to be cognizant of. But women, that body that you have, that's for your husband. You are a delight to him. He is a delight to you. And that's the two of you coming together as one flesh. Okay? To fulfill the creator's plans for you. That's not for everybody else. That's not to be put on display, regardless of how it might make you feel. It's not about how you feel. It's not about how I feel. It's about what the Father tells us to do to live a fruitful and prosperous and blessed life. And so Yeshua teaches that just laying eyes on that with lust, that's adultery. You've committed adultery and you need to repent of that. You need to understand when you have these urgings and convictions and these feelings, that's why you have a wife. That's why you have a husband. They are your help meet. And you are to be joined together, not to be looking at some woman's rear end in the grocery line or whatever. <clears throat> you do not steal. This is straightforward. You do not steal. You do not take what is not yours. The end. You do not steal. You do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Many would say this is you do not lie. That's not what this says. This says you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Am I saying you should lie? No. But I'm saying there are times when one would be put in a position where one might have to lie to preserve life. In which case, that's not a sin. This says you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. 17. You do not covet your neighbor's house, nor do you covet your neighbor's wife or husband by the way, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox or his donkey or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Get this straight. Be content and thankful for what you have and what you've been blessed with. To whom a little has been found, to whom a little can be trusted, more will be given something to that effect. If you cannot even be thankful for what you have and yet you look across the creek and covet that piece of property over there, which I am, I have been open about saying, I want that piece of land. I want it. I intend to own it. But I do not have covetous plans for it. And I have to guard my heart against being covetous towards it. Because if it's the Father's will, I'll have it. But we need to be content with what we have. We are blessed with what we have. The vast, vast majority of us have everything that we need and the vast majority of what we want. We're watching YouTube on sideways iPhones. Come on now. Life's not that bad. It's not that bad. And we need to be really thankful for what we have. We've talked quite a bit at this channel about living on a third of an acre and suburban homesteading in North Texas. And the realization for me one day that if we can't even be good stewards of this third of an acre, why would the Father ever bless us with more? And it wasn't until we started taking very seriously the care and stewardship of that third of an acre that doors started opening for us to not be on that third of an acre anymore. You leave it better than you found it, and you do not covet the people across the street or their stuff or their car or their truck or their house or their wife or their daughter or their son or their husband or their none of that. You are thankful for what you have. You are blessed by what you have. And if you were supposed to have something else, you'd have it. The Father would give it to you. As long as you're in line with Him, 
if you're heeding his voice and guarding his commands, he will show up in your life. <clears throat> and all the people saw the thunders and the lightning flashes and the voice of the shofar, the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And the people saw it and they trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moshe, you speak with us and we hear uh, and we hear but let not elohim speak with us lest we die we are afraid lest we die and this was the beginning of this relationship with moshe as the go-between between the father and his people we don't want to speak with him he scares us we're afraid we're going to die the glory of the lord let him speak with you and then you tell us and we'll find that they often forget this arrangement that they made and they begin to question, just who are you, Moshe, to tell us these things? Well, it wasn't that long ago you put me in charge of this relationship, remember? Hmm. The father says my people are a stiff-necked people. He's right. <clears throat> and Moshe said to the people, do not fear, for Elohim has come to prove you, to prove you, to prove himself to you, that should say. And in order that his fear be before you, so that you do not sin. Do not fear. He is here to prove himself to you that you are real, and that you fear him. You understand the ramifications of your actions, so that you do not sin. You just got delivered the greatest set of rules for human existence that have ever lived. And the reason he is here is to make himself known to you that should you think it might be a good idea to go commit adultery or to covet or to bear false witness or, Yah forbid, have another God above him, this is the glory of the Lord. And let this be fresh in your mind that you understand transgressing what dad has to say is a bad idea. Because if dad has to come down the hallway and put you right, it ain't going to be fun. That's what Moshe is telling the children of Israel. He's here for a reason, so that you understand it's not the messenger, it's the Most High. And when the Most High says jump, you say, yes sir, how high? We will do everything you say. This is non-negotiable. This is the agreement that they have entered into with the creator of the universe, of all things, of the things that even existed before there were things, of everything. The Alpha and the Omega, the great I Am. Yeah, they should be afraid, as should we. This is not something to take lightly. This is major. And what they're saying is we can't, we can't handle the weight of this responsibility face to face. We want you, Moshe, to be the guy. <clears throat> so the people stood at a distance, but Moshe drew near the thick darkness where Elohim was. So they stayed back, but Moshe went. The stones on that man show up we talked about that last week show up just show up the father will have his way done ideally through you because you showed up and you will experience blessing for being a piece on the chessboard of life for him show up and yahweh said to moshe say this to the children of israel you yourselves have seen that i have spoken to you from the heavens you do not make besides me mighty ones of silver, and you do not make mighty ones of gold for yourselves. No idols. Make no idols. You've seen me. You have seen me. Don't go making idols. You know what the real deal looks like. Make a slaughter place of earth for me, and you shall slaughter on it your ascending, ascending offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your cattle. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I shall come to you and bless you. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and I will bless you. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, where I cause my name to be remembered, what's his name? Yahweh. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and I will bless you. The if-then of 19, if you diligently 
hear my voice and follow my voice. And if you keep my covenant, I will come to you. In every place here in 20, chapter 20, in every place where I cause my name to be remembered, to be remembered, not known, remembered, I will come to you and bless you. And if you make me a slaughter place of stone, do not build it out of cut stone, for if you use a chisel on it, you have profaned it. Nor do you go up by steps to my slaughter place, lest your nakedness be exposed. This is a clear difference between the fakery of the Egyptians, the Mitzrites, where they had just come from, where they had been in bondage, where they had forgotten who they belonged to, whose chosen people they were, and adopted the ways of the Egyptians, versus what the Father tells them. You are my people, and you will make me an altar of stacked stone. No chisel may touch it, and you don't go up it by steps like a pyramid, lest your nakedness be exposed. Looking up your skirt, bro. This again is sanctification. He is setting his people apart. This is how you do things, to put a smile on my face. And so we have the children of Israel. They will rebel. And I mean that in the fullest sense of the word. They will rebel against the teachings of Moshe given to him by the Father wholly forgetting that they appointed Moshe as the intercessor in between the two of them, the interpreter. There is a lot of the archetype of Moshe in Yeshua. It's not a coincidence that Moshe's second in command is Joshua, Yehoshua, which is salvation, which is the name Yeshua or Yehoshua, who is salvation. The Father tells us what to do to put a smile on his face. In every place that he causes his name to be remembered, he will show up and he will bless. These Ten Commandments for us, the Father literally shows up and delivers these in full sight of the entire nation of Israel. Do not remember who it is. I'm sorry. Do not forget who it is who gave you these commandments. Remember always. Okay? And whoever remembers my name diligently hears my voice, listens for my voice, and does it, I'll add, and who guards my covenants will be blessed. And so again, we can have the age-old argument of, are the Gentiles under the same law? Has the law been nailed to the cross and done away with? Yeshua preached it. Yeshua preached the law. In fact, he was constantly telling people, if you knew Moshe, Moshe, if you knew Moses, you'd know me. But you don't know Moses. You don't know Moshe. That's why you don't know me. The prophets are constantly telling Israel to turn back to the face of the Father, to remember the old ways, to keep the old ways, to do... <coughs> Messiah himself told us, if you love me, keep my commands. Book of Acts. We have all these Gentiles who believe in the Messiah. What should they do? Do we have to circumcise them? No. Circumcise your heart. But don't strangle things. Don't eat things that have been strangled. Don't drink blood. Don't drink forni uh, Don't fornicate. Don't strangle. Don't drink blood. Don't fornicate. And then go to the temple on Shabbat, the fourth commandment, Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Keep it set apart. 
These are the instructions to the Gentiles, the non-Hebraic believers in Messiah. What should you do? Don't eat strangled food, don't drink blood, don't fornicate, and go to the temple on Shabbat and learn the Torah. This was the instruction of the brand new church after Messiah had gone home again, awaiting his second coming. It's in the book of Acts. You can go read it. <sighs> These commandments are real. The Father tells us what we are to do to be pleasing to him. And he makes it clear that if we are found to be pleasing to him, he will show up wherever his name is remembered and he will bless. So yet again, salvation is by belief in Yeshua. Not by works, lest any man should boast. Yet James would say, my brothers, let not many amongst you be teachers. And <laughs> faith without works is dead. You say you have faith, I'll show you my faith by works, by doing these things. Because Hebrews 8, 6 says we have a renewed covenant that Yeshua is the mediator, the mediator of the new covenant. Through this renewed covenant, we have Yeshua who stands in the gap in between us and the Father. 8.8 8 says, yes, there is a renewed covenant, not a new covenant. That's due to a bad translation of the Septuagint. Another story for another time. A renewed covenant through Yeshua. And 8.10 says, our half of the bargain is that his laws, the Father's laws, and Yeshua's laws, because they're one and the same, right? Are written on our heart. Because if they're on our heart, you can't set it down and walk away. They go with you everywhere. And as a fruit of belief on Yeshua and redemption in his name, you're delivered the spirit that gives you wisdom and discernment to understand whether or not you are to do these things. Well, I think wisdom is found by putting your nose in this book daily and praying to the Father that he would reveal to you and give you the discernment to understand what it is I should be doing with my life and what is your will for my life. And you don't have to go very far before you realize over and over and over again from the first page to the last page, the Father is saying, I am relentlessly pursuing you and I have a will that will be done for your life and you can get on board or get out of the way. Now, if you get on board, you'll be blessed and I will do many, many great things with you and through you or you can get out of the way. And yeah, you may not perish you may not perish, but, but, where his name is remembered, there will be blessings. And I submit for the children of Israel, that's us. These are non-negotiable. You know, I pray every single week before I do this, that it's his words, not mine. His words, not mine. Let me say the words that he needs me to say. And I've said many a time, and I'll say it again, to a very small degree, I understand what Moshe must have felt when he walked into Pharaoh's chambers. I was saying, Father, I don't have the words. Yahweh, I can't do this. Yahweh says, just show up. I got you, son. Okay. So I pray that this has been a help to you, uh, an edification for you. Edification, the best reference that I have for that is as iron sharpens iron. It's not that I've made you feel better about yourself. It's that this study of the word has helped you be better. Be better. 
not feel better, but be better at discerning the Father's will for your life, at being fulfilled, at understanding what your sense of purpose is and how living that should look. I'm not a pastor. I'm a brother. I do think to a certain extent I'm a teacher, but I'm on this journey with you guys. We're, we're man, I, I'm right there with you. I'm walking this, but I'm learning by doing, which is the Hebrew way. I'm learning by doing. And I had a conviction many months ago to just read this book cover to cover with y'all. And that's what we're doing. But the more I do that, the stronger this conviction becomes that we are to do these things. We are to do these things. And the the onus to do them has not gone away. If anything, it's been renewed by Messiah who he himself said, I came not to usurp the law, the Torah, but to fulfill it, to show you how to do this, knowing we're going to fail. And because we're going to fail, we need an intercessor. We need a mediator of renewed covenant. And yet the Father pursues us relentlessly, and yet he makes a way for us, and yet he chases us down doggedly, and you cannot get far enough away from him. You cannot put enough distance in between yourself and him that he stops loving you. I've tried. So, all he wants, all he's ever wanted, is to walk with us in the garden at the end of the day. And yet, we continuously remove ourselves from him. We hide our face from him. We are scared. Adam, where have you gone? I've hidden, Lord. Why? Because I am naked and afraid. And we're all to some degree naked and afraid. And yet and still the Father pursues us relentlessly and makes a way for us. And that's the beauty in salvation. And that's why we should be thankful every day for Yeshua, for Yeshua HaMashiach, for the Christ, the anointed, who showed us how to do this thing and who does fill in the gaps for us because we can't do it perfectly. And it's by his atoning sacrifice we're saved. Belief on his name. And then the blessings. And I'm amazed that people would say, you don't have to do that. No, I don't have to. I don't have to live a good life. I don't have to be spiritually fulfilled. I don't have to be you know, in awe and wonder and amazement and humbled daily by the depth of blessing that we experience constantly, by the way that the Father moves in our lives. I don't have to do that. You're right. I don't have to do that. But if I do, if I remember his name and diligently heed his word and guard his covenant, he shows up and I am blessed. And so will you be. And that's my message for you today. So, Shabbat Shalom. I love you guys. You guys are awesome. All my Hebrews and my Shalomi homies. Um, I'm amazed. I'm amazed by this channel and what the Father's doing. And I'm really thankful for it. And I've said many, many times, if I can only do one thing on camera each week, it would be this. There's weeks that I don't want to. <laughs> And yet the doing of transforms me. It, uh, obedience brings blessing. And I am blessed by the doing of. I'm blessed by the doing of. And so I want to encourage you to, to be blessed by the doing of. Shalom.